In this video, I'm just going to be going over a quick once over on what an oscilloscope is. Uh, they're very, very cool. We're going to call them scopes from now on because that's what the cool kids call them. And JJ says they are dynamite. Now, you're not going to end up using a scope that much out in the field. There's only been a couple times in my whole career as an electrician having used a scope in the field. That's not to say you won't, but the chances are rare. What they are excellent for, though, is for us in school to analyze waveforms, and they can tell us a lot. So let's take a look at a couple of the waveforms we're going to be dealing with. So here we go. I've got myself a sine wave. So I've got my AC sine wave that's jiggity, jiggity, jiggity there. I've got a DC, typically DC, square tooth. I've got a typical DC triangular. And then I have a sawtooth voltage here. Now the thing is, with the AC waveform, we can look at this and when we're talking about frequency and cycles. A cycle is from where a waveform starts to where it repeats itself. Well, in AC, it starts here and it starts to repeat itself there. So that is a full cycle. DC, however, is a little different. If we look at it, starting right here, this guy goes along, goes up, over, and then he repeats himself. Up, over, and then repeats itself. This being a DC waveform means it will either be all positive or all negative. So it will either sit above or below the x-axis. It's not an alternating waveform that has a positive and a negative alternation like this one here, the sine wave. Same thing goes for this triangular. It's going to start here, and that is a cycle there, and that is a cycle there. That's important when we get to frequencies. Same thing with the sawtooth. Starts here, begins to repeat itself, and away we go. So that is our DC waveforms. Now there's a lot to an oscilloscope, which I'm going to let you guys go through in the notes that I'm attaching to this. But let's talk a little bit about the probes here. And it's not these kind of probes that we're thinking about here. We're going to be talking about these probes here. So these probes are what we use to attach to the circuit. They are made out of a coaxial cable. That would be important to know because what they take care of is stray voltages. So and we want to clean up our sine wave. When we're looking at sine waves, they want to look nice and clean. And sometimes the induced voltage around can dirty that waveform up. So what the coaxial cable does is it's shielded and it gets rid of all the unwanted noise so that we get as crisp and clear a waveform as we possibly can. Now when we connect these probes, we have two channels. We have channel one and channel two. And again, just like your TV, it's a coax connection there. This means we can read two different waveforms, which is very useful when we get to AC because we can start looking at what happens when we have inductive circuits and capacitive circuits, which I'm not going to get too much into right now. You can watch the videos on capacitance and inductance on your own. But we have two channels here. Sometimes they're called channel A and B, but we're going to call them channel 1 and channel 2. Now we have this thing here, the volts per division. We'll talk about that. It has a lot to do with this little fella right here, the screen. So that's channel A's volts per division and channel B's volts per, per, division, per division, or 1 and 2. And then we have our time per division. So that helps us determine what the period is. And then from period, we can determine frequency. Now, when it comes to calibrating the probes, generally what we do is we send them out. But on some oscilloscopes, there will be a calibration knob. So what you can do is take your probe and attach it to that knob and you'll see if it is correctly compensated, you're going to see a nice square tooth wave like that. If it is undercompensated, it's got a bit of a hook to it. And if it's overcompensated, it's the other way here. we got a little nub or a little rise there. So then you would just adjust. There's a little dial on your probe. You would adjust that to get it looking more like that. But for the most part, really, just let your instructor know and they will send out and get a better probe for you. Now, when we are hooking up oscilloscopes, there is a danger of a short circuit when we've got this thing connected. Let's take a look here. I've got a line in a neutral. So let's say it's a 120 volt circuit. Our neutral is grounded as neutral should be. I take my scope and I connect it. I put my probe on one side and I take my ground clip and I attach it to the other side. The ground here is going to give me a zero reference point. It's not just grounding for safety sake. It's just giving me reference. So it's the probe is reading from this point to this point here. So it's reading like a visual voltmeter going across there like that. Now that's a proper connection because current can go through here and go down there and I can read the this scope will have a high impedance into it so it won't allow current to flow through it. 
Now let's take a look what happens if we hook it up the wrong way. With it hooked up the wrong way, I have the probe on this side now and the ground clip on this side. Current here is just going to go shoop and go right to ground and it's going to blow a fuse. And that's not a good thing, is it? And you're not going to be able to read anything. I've seen this happen in labs before and there's only one way to get around that is you either have to take all your circuits apart and find out which one has your grounded side or you can use an isolation transformer. Over here we have our isolation transformer. So this is going off to the oscilloscope. We have the primary side is grounded. If you don't understand how transformers work, make sure you watch the videos on transformers. But we have this side is grounded. This secondary side has no ground to it. So it is completely isolated. It's still protected from the primary side on this ground. But this side we have no ground. So we don't have to worry about that one circuit floating through and going down to ground and causing a short. So that's how we get rid of it is this isolation transformer. Now when we're looking at the scope, we're going to be looking at its screen, and its screen is what tells us, gives us the visual representation of what we're looking for. Also known as a graticule, on analog scopes it's a phosphor screen, but for the most part we'll be using digital scopes. It has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 divisions across, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 divisions up. We have an x-axis and a y-axis. Along the x-axis is where we determine our frequency or our period, and it is along the y-axis that will determine the amplitude of the waveform. So let's see what I mean. Let's do a couple examples here. All right, let's say that this guy here is set to 5 volts per division, which means if we're using channel 1, we'd have this guy here dialed up till it hits 5 volts per division, which would show on the bottom of this guy. Now, we've got that at 5 volts per division, so let's go back and take a look at our waveform. This is 5 volts per division. I've got a waveform here. It starts here, goes along there. Actually, it started here. It goes below, then above, then below. It continues on and on and on. Now, if we are reading the actual size of the waveform, or the peak of the waveform, I see that I've got one full division, two full divisions. I've got two full divisions. And FYI, each division is a centimeter. So sometimes you'll see it as five volts per centimeter. Anyways, I've got five volts per division. If it has got a times one probe on it, so I should have mentioned that when we talked about probes before, but your probe can be a times one or a times 10, meaning that it'll be 10 times the size when you actually read it through. I'll, I'll go over that in a second here. Times one, two times five volts per division gives me 10 volts with a times one probe. That's 10 volts peak. From there, you can determine what your RMS value is by taking peak times 0 0.707. Easy enough. If your probe was set to times 10, again, we go two full divisions times five volts per division gives me 10 times 10 for the probe. So that would mean that I am reading 100 volts, not the 10 volts. So really pay attention to your probe and is it, if it's set to times one or times 10. Now you notice these little hash marks here as well. Not all waveforms are going to be exactly full divisions. They might come up halfway through a division or whatever. Each hash mark here is 0 0.2. So it would be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So if you're taking it and you measure across and it's at 2.6 divisions, you go 2.6 times 5 to get your volts. That's how you determine that out. Now let's talk about the frequency. We talked about this volts per division. Now we're going to set the time for division, and we're going to set that to a certain amount of seconds or milliseconds per division. Now let's look back at here. We already determined that this guy with the times one probe, we're looking at 10 volts peak. Now we want to work out what the period and the frequency is. Well, let's take one alternation. I got one full division, two full divisions, three full divisions, four full divisions for an alternation. Now remember that four divisions for an alternation will mean eight divisions for a full cycle. Pay attention to that because we deal with full cycles, not just with alternations. So we're going to go 16 milliseconds and we set the time per division at two milliseconds per division. Well, sorry, we got eight full divisions. We're going to multiply it two times eight. So we're going to end up with 16 milliseconds. 
and I had to tell you before that we had this thing set to 2 milliseconds per division on the times per division dial. 16 milliseconds, that would be your period. From the, That's how long it takes from this guy to start till it starts to repeat itself. And if we want to learn about frequency or what the frequency is, all we have to do is invert that. So we take 16 milliseconds or 0 0.016 seconds and we flip it one over that, we end up with 60-ish hertz. I say 60-ish because it's actually going to be a little less than that, but we'll talk about that later. It's just a rounding issue at this point. Now there's something else that we're going to use an oscilloscope for, and that's called phase displacement. It allows us to look at different circuits and analyze their phase displacement. I'm not going to get too much into that. Go to the AC principles videos and you can learn about phase displacement there. I'm just going to show you how we measure for phase displacement. So first off, I have these two waveforms. I have a blue waveform and I have a red waveform. Now the blue waveform crosses the x-axis first, then the red waveform crosses. So in this case, I will say that blue leads red. All right. Now we're going to also figure out by how many degrees does blue read, lead red. So I look at this and I say, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 divisions, sorry, 9 divisions. Is that right? Yes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 divisions for an alternation. Well, we know that one alternation contains 180 degrees. So 180 divided by 9 gives me 20 degrees per division. So we get 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160, 180. Now we see that we have one full division between the two waveforms. Well, if we know that each division is worth 20 degrees, we can say that blue leads red by 20 degrees. And that's how we calculate out phase displacement. You look for which waveform crosses the x-axis first, then you determine how many degrees per division off of one alternation. Now both waveforms will have the same frequency because you're reading them off the same power supply. So you can use either waveform. I just used the blue. Same thing, I can use the red and still seeing that there was nine full divisions. 180 degrees per, 20 degrees per division. Then I end up with one division between the two and I get 20 degrees per division. And that's kind of the basics of what we're going to be dealing with with scopes. When we get into the lab, we'll fool around a lot more with those.